Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Spring 22 Elective Society uh, Level 1 membership program. Uh, I'm your president, Tim Duffy. It's a pleasure to finally connect with some of you live. I know that I've spoken to some of you who have scheduled some one-on-one -on -one calls with me, and I love those. And so if you haven't scheduled your one-on-one, -on -one, please do so, because I really love connecting and, how, uh, and discovering how best I can support you on your professional development journey. So today's training is, uh, again, one of my favorite. It is about, high, it's called high performance communication for friends, families, and foes. Uh, I think that, you know, you've probably heard, whether it's your relationship or anything, that communication is the most important skill. And so we're going to do a deep dive in terms of communication, specifically about personality types. Now, before I begin, and I want to start, all of you should have already completed a, a pre and uh, a pre assessment of the program. If you haven't done so, I'm going to paste right now in the chat uh, a pre assessment of the program. Again, this was all part of your acceptance email that you should all have, but I'm going to post it just in case there are a little couple of stragglers that still need to do it and haven't done so. So I'm going to post it there right now. And then once we're done with this presentation and training, we will have a post assessment just for this program. So uh, let's uh, jump in. I'm going to share my screen and then we can begin. So here is the presentation. So uh, at, by, th by this moment, you should have already seen the orientation video. So you should probably be sick and tired of hearing about me and my bio. Uh, and this is who I am. But for those of you who haven't, again, Tim Duffy, pleasure to meet all of you. I've been doing success and leadership training uh, and coaching for over 17 years now. Uh, was a very active student leader, president of student government awards, et cetera. Uh, after I graduated, I did work in government. And then I really made a profound difference by working for the National Society of Leadership and Success and managed over 40 employees, over 600 interns. And now I'm the president of Duffy Leadership Incorporated and Electus Society. And so uh, today's presentation is all about high performance communication for friends, families, and foes. And so what are going to be the learning outcomes of this training? You are going to discover your preferred communication style and behavioral tendencies. And this could include your strengths and your weaknesses. My other goal is to develop more compassion and understanding of people, including other people's personal and political beliefs. Right now, I don't know if all of you would agree with me, we're, as I mentioned in the orientation video, we're just so polarized. Uh, you can't even talk to anybody who's on the opposite political side of you. And to me, that's a big problem because uh, in, in only through discussion and collaboration and understanding can we actually get resolution. And so one of the things that I find fascinating about personality types and um, you know personality traits is some of the people that we can't stand are the people who are um, opposite of our personality type. And so we're going to do a deep dive on that. And I'm not an expert, but I've quoted some studies that says that your personality tends to lean towards a political orientation. I had never known that. So I think that it helped me understand other people who believe different things than I do. So if I can share that information with you, I think it will help you, especially as you all navigate and, and have conversations with people across the political aisle. Then I'm going to talk about how to flex to other people's communication styles so you can be more effective. And like I said before, there are people that you can't stand. <laughs> and I want you to understand that maybe it's because they have the opposite communication style as you. And I always share that I was really misled when I did a lot of different personality assessments and communication assessments when I was in college or even after college as part of my professional development, they're like, all communication styles are different. We're all like a rainbow. And once we all come together, we can be successful. Well, that sounds very nice and hippy dippy, you know, and I believed it. But guess what? As I was committed to actually succeed and move forward in my career, I had a personality communication style. And in order for me to get ahead, 
I had to adapt that and that there was a person, uh, there was a specific personality and behavioral style that if you can adopt this, especially if it's opposite of you, you are going to get further ahead. And if you already have that skill, great, or that, that behavior or personality type, that's wonderful, but maybe you can actually polish and improve the other communication styles because I would like you to be all uh, be able to communicate to any type of person in any given situation. So let's keep going. So here's my disclaimer. I am not a psychotherapist. I don't have a degree in uh, psychology or personality assessments. I just am really interested in leadership and influence and in my discovery of dis uh, how to influence and persuade people and my discovery leadership, one of the most essential things was to discover about personality types, how to connect and communicate with people. So what I have provided to you today is I'm going to go into the what psychology says is the big five traits of personality. Now, how did they develop these five big traits of personality? Well, they said, well, what is all the different types of words in our in our language that we use to describe people? And then they categorized them, then they filtered them down, filtered, 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 and then they came up with these five personality traits. Now, again, there are different extremes, right? So you could either be on one spectrum or the other or somewhere in the middle or any along that area. But I think that it was very important for you to all to understand what psychology says about personality. And then my favorite is uh, if some of you are already leaders involved in different leadership programs, one of the things is you, you may have taken personality tests. You have may, maybe attended workshops. The, one of the most popular personality tests out there is the Myers-Briggs uh, type indicator, MBTI. I did it in college. I did it at a leadership retreat. I found it helpful, but I think that there's a lot of limitations to it. And I'll explain to you what I mean by that. I, I know people who swear by that and live it and love it. You do you, I got it, uh, very helpful, but I don't think it's the best, and I'll, and I'll explain why. The other things that you may have heard of, especially if you go to different colleges or leadership programs, there's something called true colors, where all personalities can be boiled down to four distinct types. Uh, I use DISC. Uh, that is what a lot of four-person personality type, that is what corporations use, uh, you know, Fortune 500 companies, and they may not specifically say that they're using a disc, but if you have ever applied for a job or plan to apply for a job, they may ask you to fill out a personality test. And what it will be is a variation of disc as well as maybe a somewhat of an IQ test. They just want to know if you can actually handle cognitive different uh, uh, things, et cetera. And also I will occasionally look at the chat and I see Carter that uh, you had a question about the recording. Yes, uh, everybody who's in this training and everybody who is not participating a few hours after the training, I will be emailing the recording so everybody can have it. So you can always rewatch it, okay? Great question, Carter. So let me share with you why I don't like Myers-Briggs. In Myers-Briggs, they say that there are 16 personality types. Holy moly, how am I supposed to remember all of these things? Here are some of them. E for extra virgin, P for perceiving, J for judging, N for intuition and sensing. So are you an ISTJ or are you an ENTJ or an ENTP? So <laughs> to me, just saying that is very, very complicated. No doubt that it could provide some value, but I think I need something more simple, easy to use that can really help me connect with other people. So that's why I embrace DISC. Now, here are, uh, before I go into DISC, I'm going to go into the big five traits of personality. And guess what? You'll start to see some of these big five traits in DISC in these four quadrants of, uh, of personality. So the first one is extroversion. So I'm, I imagine that all of you have probably heard, oh, I'm an extrovert, I'm very outgoing. Well, that is a way to describe somebody who is very excitable, expressive, but on the opposite extreme is what we call someone who's introverted. They may tend to be more quiet, 
more thoughtful and more reserved. Doesn't mean that they're just more considerate. It just thoughtful is just a way where they're more in their thoughts and, and observing, right? Instead of expressing everything that they may say. So I used a, a two polar opposites to demonstrate that. One is Jim Carrey, you know, very outgoing, uh, you know, uh, person. And then you have uh, Keanu Reeves, right? This actor who <laughs> he was very quiet. And, and you know, uh, if you've ever seen the Matrix or the original Matrix, there's a scene where he's like, he sees the most fantastical thing. And instead of saying, oh my gosh, that's the most amazing thing. He says, oh. <laughs> so it's a very, very, very quiet, reserved uh, expression. So I think he's the perfect example of, of doing that. And I can already see Susan and Carter, you've already put your Myers-Briggs in there. I think that's great. You know, uh, I hope that you will enjoy this, especially you will start to see uh, your personality types in not only the big five traits, but also in the uh, disc. So there's extra version. The next one, which I think is one of the most important traits to talk about, is agreeableness. Now, I don't know if all of you have ever seen the TV show uh, Big Bang Theory. I'm a big fan of it. I've really enjoyed it. But on one extreme, you have this character named Leonard. He would be described as, according to the big five traits, is a very agreeable person. This is a person who is cooperative, very kind, very affectionate, and it's almost, uh, you know, uh, very nurturing. You almost see him as a parent to Sheldon, this character on the opposite extreme, where uh, Leonard, you know, caters to him and is willing to drive him to school, uh, helping to pick up his food and exactly the way he wants it. So again, very agreeable, right? He's, he's down for whatever. On the opposite extreme is Sheldon. Sheldon is, would be described as disagreeable. He's very self-focused, very assertive with what he wants. Today, uh, you know, if, if Leonard or Penny said, hey, let's have pizza tonight. He's like, no, today is Tuesday. We have tacos on Tuesday, right? And he's like, even though somebody else may want that, he is very certain in what he really wants. And so some people may just be described that as being insensitive, right? Thinking about what you want versus what somebody else wants. Now, I have to make a confession. I used to be a very agreeable person. And I actually thought in my binary type of mind, oh, agreeableness is good. Disagreeableness is bad, right? Good, bad. But life is never that binary. It's never that just there's something good and there's something bad. I started to discover that it's important to have both. And let me give you a perfect example where it may be good to actually be disagreeable versus being agreeable all the time. If, for example, all of you are into the workforce and you're working for a job, and let's just say you're a program coordinator or whatever it is, and you do your job very well, and you find out in research that you're, uh, you are getting paid, let's just say $50,000 a year salary. Now, what happens if you start researching program co coordinators in your profession after this much of your experience are getting paid 60,000, 65,000, whatever it may be, right? I'm just picking these numbers out of a hat, so don't hold me to that. And so then your job says, Tim, you're doing such a great job that we want to give you a raise. Here is an additional $2,000. Congratulations. And so now you're going to get paid $52,000. Now, in the past, I would have just said, oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. You know, uh, uh, thank you for giving me a raise. And that would be it. But guess what? I have now discovered that many times there are moments when you actually need to be disagreeable. You may need to know what you're worth. You may to say, thank you so much. However, I've been doing research. There are other positions that, uh, that I'm qualified that are paying X number of dollars. Can I get a raise of X? Can I get paid $70,000 you know, for all my performance? And here are all the reasons, et cetera. And if you had watched my bonus training that I sent in my acceptance uh, email that I sent to all of you, you would have seen 
uh, professional success one-on-one, how to get a raise or get promoted, it will talk about those tips on how to get raises or get promoted. So you would know the exact language that you could use to do that. So going back to this example, so do you see how being agreeable is not always the best in any given situation and it's not just good or bad? So I actually believe that, and I've actually coached people to say, there are times where if you tend to say yes to everybody all the time, then I would invite you to become a little bit more disagreeable. I used to um, say yes to everything in my relationships with my wife. And guess what ended up happening? And I don't know if any of you resonate with this too. If you're the person who always is trying to be liked by people and say yes and everything, and you want something else, but you're always saying yes to other people just because that's what they want, what ends up happening is sometimes you can develop resentment. You're like, I don't want to do that, but I'm just doing this. And you can end up getting mad, angry, or upset with them. And what you, what's really going on is you're really upset with yourself. Or you start creating rules for yourself that says, well, I'm going to say yes, but I expect you to do this, even if you haven't verbalized that. So I was having a lot of conflict in my relationship with my wife. And I read a book that was very powerful. It was called No More Mr. Nice Guy. And it really helped me uh, transform my relationships uh, with my wife and with other people. And, and many times she would say, Tim, can you come over to uh, this event that we're having with my mother, this tea ceremony at at, at this location. And I'm like, no, I'm not going. I have this, this, and this to do. And she would get upset, but she actually later on complimented me. She's like, well, you know, I didn't like it because you used to be so agreeable, but at least you're sticking up for yourself. And I, I appreciate you. Like you do you. And so it, it really helped the conflict. So if any of you are, are suffer from being too agreeable, I hope this, this training is going to help you be a little bit more assertive, right? The next uh, personality, big five trait is a tough one to say. It's called conscientious, conscientious. I know it's very difficult to pronounce and say, but it is very, very important. On one extreme, somebody who's highly conscientious is somebody who's very organized, very detail or oriented. Can you imagine that they have a checklist of all the things that they need to get to do to that day and are enjoying checking them off? Very disciplined. So I used an example of somebody in the military. This was from a movie, uh, you know, with Cuba Gooding Jr. And you, you just know the discipline that they have when they wake up, their shoes have to be aligned. They have to fold their bed. They have their routine. They do their pushups. It's just a very highly conscientious person. On the other extreme is somebody who's very unconscientious. And so if you've ever seen this movie, it's very popular called The Big Lebowski. This is a, a character played by Jeff Bridges called The Dude. And you could just tell he got out of bed. He's wearing his, you know, like a uh, sweater, like a uh, robe and going shopping. And he's the complete opposite. He is relaxed. You know, he could be easily distracted and he will tend to procrastinate like, oh, I don't feel like doing it right now. I'll just do it some other time. So those are the two extremes. So I really want you to think about like, where do you fall? Are you more conscientious or unconscientious? Or maybe there's sometimes you are and sometimes you're not. It, it all depends. But I put a little star here because I find that this is something that's very interesting that I research. Because remember how in the beginning of this training, I promised to you, uh, promised you to go over about politics. Uh, so I wanted to share with you what research has said about politics and big personality traits and, and what they discovered about conscientiousness as a personality. This is a study that was done. Uh, it was called the Big Five Personality. Oh, I'll, I'll fix that. Traits and political orientation: an inquiry into political beliefs. And what they discovered is uh, the trait conscientious increases, the level of conservatism increases. Now that was very interesting. And again, this is not all for the police or the military, but I have just observed that anytime I've experienced different individuals, just meeting and encountering, I tend to see a little bit more conservatism. Okay, this is just for, based on my observation. But what this paper says, as you tend to be more conservative, why? It's because conscientious individuals want stable and predictable environments that have familiarity. 
conscientious is just one of many personality traits that affects someone's political orientation. But when paired with the trait of openness, which we're going to get to next, it becomes even a larger predictor of political orientation. So fascinating. Don't get mad at me. Don't shoot the messenger and says, Tim, I know other people in the military or, or armed services that are very liberal. I, 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 okay, I understand that. You know, I just wanted to share with you what they've discovered. And these are just tendencies. Uh, you know, it's, it's easy to talk about things in extremes. We know that everybody is different, but it just helps in terms of a, having you all have a better understanding of different people. So here's the next one, openness to experience. So there was another uh, older famous movie called Sister Act. I don't know if any of you have seen it. Uh, I highly recommend it. And so there's one characteristic, which is openness to experience. There's a character, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of the plot of the movie, uh, who is played by Whoopi Goldberg, and she's a Las Vegas performer. So she's singing, very creative. And guess what? She witnesses a murder. And so in order to uh, you know, protect her uh, as a witness, they put her in protective custody. And guess where they put her? In a convent in New York City. And so she has to be a nun. And it's just a hilarious, fun, entertaining movie. But you could just kind of see that she's a little bit different than all the other nuns. You know, what kind of nun do you see wearing sunglasses? And so she would be a, a great person to describe as having this high trait of openness because she's curious, adventurous, creative. On the opposite extreme, you have somebody with low openness and this was the mother superior. And you could tell that she was a lot more resistant, a little bit more closed, unchanging. She said, these are the rules. This is what we've done. This is what we've always done. And this is how it always needs to be done, right? Didn't want change. And so they had that conflict, but you'd have to watch the movie to figure out what is the result of all of that. So uh, here is what it relates to political orientation. So in this study, uh, they found a two standard uh, deviation increase in trait openness correlated with liberalism. So that what I found was very interesting. And so you can break people down in term liberalism or now they call it progressivism or it depends on your definitions, but uh, let's, let's just stick with liberalism. You could be socially liberal or you can be economically liberal. And here's what is what the kicker was. Liberals uh, 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 tend to be or, or more likely to be higher in trait openness. Why? Because guess what? Uh, liberals are pushing the boundaries. They don't want the fix. They're like, we need to change the policies. You know, we need to make changes that are different, that's social and economic. So again, very, very fascinating and helped me to understand, oh, this is one of the reasons why maybe you might have conflict in between people who may be conservative and people who might be liberal. So I hope that this is as insightful as it is to me as it is for you. So um, let's talk about the last personality trait. And if this is from the TV show Game of Thrones. So if you've ever seen the TV show Game of Thrones, I'm a big fan. And there's a character played by Samuel Tully. And he would be described as somebody with high neuroticism. What does that mean? Somebody who's highly neurotic means they have extreme fluctuations in moods and emotions. So they can be considered moody, they can be considered anxious, or they can be considered very emotional. And what was so fascinating about this is I, I really appreciated learning about this uh, big five personality trait. You want to know why? Because I had friends and family that anytime there was a, any given situations, they would freak out, they would stress out, and, oh no, I don't know what to do. And suddenly I would say, what's wrong with you? Like, can't you just calm down, just relax? And after I just started to discover, I didn't even know about this concept of neuroticism and that, you know, different people have different levels of anxiety. I thought everybody has anxiety, but guess what? Some people have it much more extreme than others. And so this helped me become much more empathetic to those individuals. Instead of saying, oh, there's something wrong with you. Why don't you relax? Stay calm. I was like, oh, now I can actually label it. I can describe it oh, they may have high levels of neuroticism. And this is this happens. And if you've seen the show of Game of Thrones, you see 
Sam, uh, 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 Samuel Tully is always afraid. He's nervous and things like that. But, you know, as you progress and you see the show, I think it's very powerful because he starts to have more experiences. He starts to develop his confidence and, and, and can be very heroic in certain moments throughout the story. So again, just because you have high levels of neuroticism doesn't mean that I think that that's the end all and be all. Uh, just my personal belief, I would love to have people, and I, this is what I imagine a lot of psychotherapists do when people have a lot of fears, they try to work with people to help overcome those fears, even through a little bit baby steps, whatever that may be. So uh, just something to consider, very helpful for me. The other extreme is low neuroticism. So <laughs> if you could see this character, if you all remember from Game of Thrones, Tywin Lannister, and he is stable, relaxed, calm. You could walk up right up to him and said, somebody just died in your family. And he's like stone face. He's like, not batting an eye, ready to move on. What's next? You know, what's happening? And he's just very cold. And just some people can be uh, uh, more, or I should say, have less neuroticism, right? They don't as emotionally react as other people. Just very, very helpful to understand. So those are the big five traits, extroversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness, high openness, and high neuroticism. So where do you think you fall in that? So at this point, I want to get a couple people's thoughts. So uh, feel free to raise your hand. I would like to hear uh, when you were listening to these traits, which one uh, do you find that you tend to have a little bit more extreme in others? I love to share. And, uh, and also, you're more than welcome to uh, comment in the chat. But while we're waiting for some people, I might just call upon some people. So for example, uh, how about Elizabeth Maxwell? Uh, can you unmute yourself? What did you see in these uh, traits? Did you find yourself in any of them? I was actually in the car when you put the link in the chat and I um, started a new job this week, so I'm working on it right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no problem. Work on the pros assessment. I'll go to someone else. Thanks for sharing. Let me know. How about Poonam? How about you? Uh, what did you think? Uh, where did you see yourself in this? Um, I definitely saw myself as an introvert and agreeable because sometimes I have the tendency to say yes, mm. even if um, I don't agree with it, probably because I want to please someone or maybe <laughs> I'm be scared to say no. So that's what I noticed. Yes. And so I think that's very good that you discovered that now that means there's an opportunity for you, right, to actually get outside your comfort zone and to say no. I tell you from personal experience, saying no is something that is so beneficial that a lot of people don't do. You shouldn't be forced to do things just in order to make people like you. And, and, and it's like a muscle, like when you lift weights, whenever, you, when you say no, like it might be hard, but the more you say it, the, the, the stronger you are at saying no. Uh, okay, so thanks so much for sharing that. Uh, Ida, if I pronounce your name correctly, uh, I see your hands raised. Uh, unmute yourself. What are your thoughts? Where did you fi find yourself in these uh, big five traits? So yes, you did say my name correctly. And secondly, with the what's interesting about the agreeable and the disagreeable is that I kind of fall into both because I like to have harmony within a group setting. But yeah. then again, at the same time, there will be moments where I will be more assertive and disagree with someone else's either viewpoint or approach. So I found that very interesting about myself. Well, I think that's a, a very compliment to you because to be able to do that in any given situation means that I would assert that you have a lot, a strong sense of self, right? And you know what you want and you know what you don't want. And you could also play nice, right? You could be very welcome in a group environment. No, I think that's great. So, um, I, and I'm just seeing a, some of the comments. I think that's great. I think I'm agreeable, an extrovert. Yes, uh, introverts can be agreeable, a little bit of both. Uh, Absolutely. So as you can all see, you're playing with this, right? Hey, I sometimes see I can be a little neurotic, uh, you know, or have some high neuroticism. Other times, uh, I could be much more conscientiousness, uh, other times not. So again, this is all part of understanding people and personalities. Let's keep going. So um, what does DISC tell us? Now, now we're jumping into DISC. Now, when I first did a training on DISC, these are the things that uh, they taught me uh, what DISC tells you. 
DISC tells you your behavioral tendencies, how you contribute, uh, your challenges under stress, uh, how you problem solve and learn, and what I always like to add, why you dislike certain people. And then I was also told, and this is why I'm sharing with you, uh, what DISC doesn't tell you. It doesn't tell you how emotionally intelligent you are, how mature you are, how well you perform a task. But guess what? They also taught me when I first had this training, that it doesn't determine whether you'll be successful in your career. I beg to differ. My life experience and training has shared with me that there are traits that are a bigger predictor than success. So this is why I think elective society is so important and why these trainings are so important, because I want to tell you, after being in the workforce, what is really going on? Not just coming from an educator who studied this and then just you know spitting it back out. I want to share you my experience and opinion. There is additional research that you can show and, and, and study on the predictions of success. And, and you'll find that the behavior traits that I'm going to talk about are going to be a better indicator of, of being successful. So I'm going to share them with what you are. So there are a lot of online tests uh, that you could do for DISC. There's a free one. I will actually, during the Q&A, uh, I, I will see, or in my email to all of you when I send out the recording, I'll actually share with you a free link to do a DISC test. And you can answer a bunch of questions and then it, boom, it will spit out whether you're a D, I, S, or C. Now, you don't have that test right there, right here, right now. But guess what? I have two questions to share with all of you. And depending on how you answer these questions will tell you most likely where you are in terms of DISC uh, as a personality assessment. So here are the two questions and I'll, I'll go with the first one. Imagine that you are walking into an environment, into a room. You've never been in there before. You open it up and I want you to ask this, yourself this question. How do you see yourself when you walk into the room? Do you see yourself more as what we would call active, where you believe that you can shape that environment? So if you walk into an environment, how you see yourself, it's quiet. You're like, man, I'm excited. Why is it so quiet in here? Let's make some noise. You want to shape that environment. Or when you enter a new environment, a new room, do you say to yourself, uh, you know what, I, I don't know this place, I want to be more thoughtful, right, where you want to adapt to the environment where, oh, everyone's quiet, maybe I should be quiet too. So just as a, as a side note, when I say the word thoughtful, there's a lot of definitions, it doesn't mean that you're not considerate, it just, we're just using that as just a term to describe how you would be, be uh, perceived yourself when you enter the environment. So write that down right now somewhere. Are you more active or more thoughtful when how you see yourself when you go into a new environment? Now, some people may ask, well, Tim, what, well, I, I may act differently in different environments. What about my work environment? What about my family environment? Guess what? People can have different personalities when they're out in their job or when they're amongst their family. So guess what? No matter what you choose, it's that's that's your personality type in that environment. So there can't be any right or wrong answer. So just as I'll let you know. So the next question is, you enter this room. So you're either active or thoughtful, right? When you enter the environment. And now you're in this room and there's a bunch of people sitting around the table and they're talking. And there's a bunch of papers there, computers and everything like that. Now my question to you is, what do you focus on? Now, there are some people that will say to themselves, what are those people doing? What is that on the paper? Those are people that are considered more task oriented, like figuring out what is going on here versus others who'd say they see a bunch of room like, oh, my gosh, there's Lisa. Oh, my goodness. There's Mohammed. Like they don't really care <laughs> what's going on with what task they're doing. They're more concerned about the people. So I like you to ask yourself that question. Hey, are you uh, more task oriented or people oriented? Now, I, I see from Shania, she asked the question, what, if, what about both? Yes, 
there are moments where you could be both in this environment, right? Or whether you're active or thoughtful. I just want you to ask yourself this question. If you're going into a new environment that you've never been before, where would you tend to lean, right? I can understand that you might be both in both different environments, but new environment, you've never been there before. Do you lean towards this or do you lean towards that? So ask yourself that question. And if you still don't know, we're going to go through DISC and I'm going to explain each personality type. And then I want you to see for yourself, ah, yes, that's more like me or like, mm, no, that's not me. So you'll help discover that for yourself as we continue. Okay. So task oriented or people and oriented, whether it's what you focus on. So once you answer those two questions, whatever the answer is, that will tell you your DISC personality style um, preference. So if you are considered active and task oriented, you are most likely a D for dominant. Now, I know that dominant is a, uh, sometimes can be a very negative term. I don't want to, it, it to become across that. Um, you know, I'm just, it's just a key place word uh, holder for somebody who takes, you know, uh, control over a situation, uh, environment or whatever it is. So uh, don't, don't read too much into it. Uh, the next one is active and people oriented. You are considered an I for influencer. And if you're thoughtful and then just focus on the task, you're considered C for conscientious. Notice now how they're using a term from the big five trait of personality, C for conscientious. So just letting you uh, be aware of that. And then if you're thoughtful, you go into this new environment, but you're focused on the people, you are considered S for steadiness. Now, some of these other DISC personality assessments, there's different companies that do um, DISC. Uh, one has an I, that's capital I, one's lowercase I, that's a registered trademark. They may use different terms to describe the different things. I've seen other tests that say S for stability, uh, you know, et cetera. Um, so it doesn't matter, but for the sake of this presentation, I'm gonna use these terms, okay? So those are them. So now let's go into each one. The first is dominant, okay? Remember, these are the people who believe that they can shape the environment and are focused on the task. So for them, it's all about what's going on here. They tend to be adventurous, tend to be very decisive, tend to be very direct. Uh, they love to solve problems and are all about, okay, everybody hurry up, let's get the results. Their motto is hurry up, let's go people because they got a bunch of stuff to do. And if you've ever seen any of the Marvel movies, I chose a couple of characters that from movies, television that represent a, a D for dominant. So the perf perfect one was Tony Stark from Iron Man. You just see how, how he's like, does what he wants, get to the point, what's going on here, solving the problem, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Viola Davis played in uh, the uh, head uh, manager in this movie Suicide Squad, if you've ever seen that. She's a lady that doesn't mess around, direct to the point, even a little bit of cutthroat, and you know that sh she would be considered a dominant. And guess what? I threw this one in here because this is sometimes people, throws people off. Uh, remember uh, Howard's wife uh, and uh, Bernadette? She was so sweet, right? Had such a high-pitched voice, but guess what? She was a dominant, and you could actually see it show up in the relationship with Howard, in her job, her performance. So don't be misled by looks or people's voices. You know, people can have a, 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 a tendency or personality that can really show. So uh, that's why I love using all of those examples. So let's go into what are the, um, uh, uh, the four different categories about dominance. First of all, how do dominance bring value to the team? They initiate activity. They are bottom line organiza organizers and they love a challenge. Given the challenge, they'll want to overcome it. They can be very competitive. Now, if you're a dominant, I'd love for you to put in your chat to see uh, who here tends to resonate a little bit more with dominant. But if you were to go to a job or have a workplace, do you know what type of environment that you would love the most? is something that has freedom of control. If I went to a dominant and I had an employee 
and I've had them, uh, and they can be tough to manage sometimes. I'd say, do this, 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 this. They would be like, they don't want to be told exactly what to do. They just want to tell me what you want done, and I'll figure it out, and I'll, I'll do it the fastest way I can. So it's just very interesting dynamic. Uh, but they, they, they can't be micromanaged, is what I'm trying to tell you. They like to work with the challenge opportunity. If you put a dominant and you say, you're going to do the same job every single day with no variety, they would be miserable, okay? They would not be happy. And, and they need a forum where they get to express their ideas. If I was managing a dominant and I say, everybody, I don't want to hear any of your comments. This is what we're doing. Let's zip it and then move forward you could see the dominant moving in his chair, you know, like being so frustrated because they have ideas. They need to express themselves. I don't like this. I want to do this, you know, and it could be very, very challenging. So if you would want to create that environment where they can express themselves. Now, when it comes times to stress, they're under a lot of high pressure. Guess what dominance can be? Very demanding. Lisa, do this, do it now, you know, uh, because they're under high stress. They can be considered very aggressive. They can be considered very egotistical because uh, that is what they're so busy focused on what needs to be done or what at that certain moment that they may be like, well, why aren't you thinking about other people instead of just yourself? So that's something uh, to, to consider when they're under high pressure. Possible limitations. They could overuse their position. They may lack tact or diplomacy and then take on too much too soon, too fast. So for example, uh, I've known many Ds uh, in my career and they're like, guess what? They're so easy at getting stuff done that they're so used to, yes, yes, let's get it done. Come on, come on, come on. And before they know it, they've said yes to so many things and they're like, oh crap, I have so much stuff to do. And guess what they'll do? They'll pull all nighters, right? Well, get it done, get it, get it done. So they are what we call burning the candlestick on both ends. So they end up to be overworking themselves, a little stressed too out, trying to be the self uh, too thin. And they might do things so quickly that they're not doing it very thorough or they might do it mess. I don't even know if that's a word, messily, but very messy, okay? How many of you know a people who is a dominant, you know, raise, raise your digital hand. I'd love to hear, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Carter, I, I'm seeing uh, you say uh, you're getting burnt too often. Uh, is this you, uh, Carter? Do you tend to be a high D? You can unmute yourself. Oh, <laughs> Shania, they're talking about you. And then uh, Susan, I think I saw your hand raised. Are, do you identify yourself a little bit? You can unmute yourself as a high D. A dominant no sometimes. i know people that are high d's oh yeah who who who's an example um base, well actually before before his stroke my boyfriend he was a very high high day very yep. let's get this done da, 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 you know and then he was then he had a stroke so now he's more of a low more key. mellow i'm sorry to hear yeah. that he had a stroke but yes yeah. Perfect example of a D. Uh, Aisha, I see your hand raised, and then Carter. So Aisha, uh, are you a D or uh, no people? Yeah, no, I definitely identify myself as being a D just because of like currently the amount of things that I have on my plate and the way that I just keep saying yes to other things, mm -hmm. even though I know that like I'm not going to be able to maybe do everything as perfect that it should be. I'd be pulling all nighters all the time trying to get everything done. So I definitely like associate that with myself well no i'm so glad that you recognize that now i'm going to tell you to give you a little bit of a lifeline d's are some of the most uh you know uh, uh um, frequent individuals who tend to be in positions of leadership in an organization why because they can be easily promoted because they get so much stuff done and that's the reason why they say yes to do everything because guess what other people it takes a lot longer for them to do something but d's are so focused on tasks that they don't get distracted like a boom 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 so when somebody asks them to do something like i'll do it but if they're so used to saying yes and getting stuff done that 
it can be a limitation. So I think that is very important for you to recognize that and, and do say no. And I think this was also in that training about how to say no that I share with you about professional success, something that's, uh, or no, no, it's going to be in the biggest challenge uh, leaders face. So it's an upcoming training. I'm going to teach all of you how to say no correctly, or the best way to not avoid burnout. Uh, Carter, you had your hand raised. Uh, so uh, what about you? Uh, do you identify it as a D or know people like this? I'm exactly like this. I will have to say over, um, I think, honestly, thanks to quarantine through like the break and everything that we've had, mm -hmm. I managed to learn how to set proper boundaries and oh, like recognize yeah. the effects of it. But I still find myself, you know, trying to like overwork myself because there is that like addicting aspect and satisfaction in getting so much done and seeing other people pleased. Yeah. Um, but yeah. No, no, I, I think that that's, uh, I'm very happy that you're learning your boundaries. But again, this is attention to all of you who are Ds or no Ds um, uh, is know their limitations. Uh, you know, I, I, one of the things that we didn't talk about or anybody uh, didn't mention here, but because they're so task oriented and getting stuff done, they can be a lack diplomacy. So they can actually rub people the wrong way. So again, I want to keep going in terms of the discussion, but that's something to be really reflective because I've met a lot of D's and the, and people view them as cold and, and cutthroat and assertive and aggressive. But like, if you actually talk to them, they got, they're humans too. <laughs> they got feelings. They feel bad. They get happy. They get sad. It's just that they have a lot more assertiveness. They could be a lot more direct. One of the funniest things to see is two dominants into an argument, bah, 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 bah. and other people are saying, oh my gosh, they're about to fight. And then they end the conversation and you ask both of the individuals who are high Ds, how did that conversation go? And they're like, it was fantastic. We resolved the issue. And you're like, I thought you guys were arguing and yelling. And they're like, yes, because there were two dominants coming to head like two bulls, but they actually respected each other and asserted their points and were able to listen. Again, that doesn't always happen, but uh, just something to uh, keep in mind. And then I see Susan, I'm very task oriented, but know my limits. Very, very good. So let's keep going with uh, the second personality uh, style, according to DISC. And that's the influencer. This is the person who's very um, active, right? They shape the environment that they go into. Hey, let's make some noise. And then they're really focused on people. So uh, these are some characters from The Office, from Friends, and from The Big Bang Theory. Again, these are all people people uh, that really like people, and etc. cetera. So um, uh, like Joey um, and all these other different characters. So for them, an influencer is somebody who can be very charming. They can be very convincing, very optimistic, very persuasive. They're very sociable because they like people. Now, their motto is, everybody, we need to hurry up so that we can talk and hang out more. So here are the different characteristics of influencers. So they're great because they um, love a team. They're always optimistic. They're always enthusiastic. Uh, and, and they love to motivate other people like rah, rah, your cheerleader. Uh, and if there's a lot of conflict, these people are like, okay, let's resolve this. Let's all, everybody, let's get along. So it's very nice to be in a team where you have somebody who really cares about people and wants people to be happy and to move things forward, makes a very positive, uplifting environment. Now, if you are an influencer, you can more than welcome to put that in the chat if you, if you identify as an influencer. They need a high degree of people uh, connections. What do I mean by that? I, <laughs> I remember I had an employee and he was very outgoing and it would drive me crazy because I wanted him as a manager to do his job and do it very well. And when he was struggling with his job, I would see him walk around the office talking with different people. And in my head, I'm like, why are you talking so much? You should be focusing on your job. But guess what? I started to discover later on, to try to become a better manager that guess what? He is a high eye. If I told him that he needed to lock himself in a room and just do his work, 
he would be miserable and he would quit the job because he still needs people and connections. So I had a great conversation with him. As long as he gets his job done, he can still connect with people. And guess what? He did a job very well and he ended up breaking company records in sales. And that's uh, you know what his department was. So I'm very, very happy. So uh, you know, just because you talk with people doesn't mean you can't be successful. Uh, they need freedom of movement. I consider myself a high influencer. Whenever I'm working in a different environment or my desk, I sometimes get bored and tired of working the same environment. I want to work on the couch. I want to work in my office. I want to work in my living room, uh, depending if I'm in my home office. So they just need to be not locked up into one place. And then the last thing is an influencer needs a democratic supervisor whom they can associate with. The biggest conflicts I have ever had was with I had dominant bosses and I, I was an influencer and they wanted me to just shut my mouth, do what I needed to do and get it done. But I had questions, I had opinions, I wanted to express myself. And so it was very, very difficult. I learned how to navigate that. And I'll, I'll just share with you some of the techniques that I, uh, that I used that we'll be talking about later in terms of improving your communication is when my dominant boss would come in, you know, and listen, uh, people would describe her in different ways. You know, they would get, describe her in some ugly names as well. But I, I got along with her very, very well. And she would just say, I need to do this. Remember, dominance under high stretch. We need to get something done. Do no, blah, 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 blah. And I would say, okay, so it's very clear that you want to get this and this and this done because of this. Is that correct? They're like, yes. Now they feel like I actually would listen to them instead of just disagreeing with them. And then I would say, okay, great. I have an idea that of how we can help you do exactly that even faster. Can I share it with you? And guess what? 50% of the time or either, no, let me correct that. Many times they would say, okay, give it to me. Because if they hear faster getting it done, right? That, that would motivate them to want to hear it. I would then say it. And, and, and guess what? When I was around other people, 50% of the time she would say, yes, let's do exactly what you said. Good job, Tim. And then the other 50% of the time she wouldn't say yes. And you want to know why? This is my theory. We were surrounded by other people, meaning I, I think that she had, you know, uh, a little bit of an insecurity, wanted to be the big boss or under high stress. And so didn't want to look like I was undermining her because I had all this experience. But guess what? Whenever I had those conversations behind closed doors in meetings with that, that director, guess what ended up happening? 99% of the time she would say, yes, let's do what you're saying. So it's very interesting. So I'm sharing this with you to help you as you all navigate different personality types in your jobs, your career, in your teams, there may be advantages for you to have actually have a private conversation and not around people so that you can actually communicate and improve your communication. So. Hopefully, I hope that helps some of you. Um, under stress, influencers, self-promoting, overly optimistic. They can talk a lot. You know, I know this, whenever I'm really nervous, I keep talking and then I'm looking at people's faces and I don't, I'm not seeing any reaction. And guess what? I don't know if they got what I heard, what I actually said. So guess what I do? I repeat myself again, but then I use different words to describe the same thing I just said before. So again, something for you to recognize if you're a high influencer uh, to work on. Uh, the next thing is overly optimistic. It's a problem. And I'll tell you why. I used to believe that like, everybody's awesome. Everybody can do anything, you know, especially if you're in this leadership environment, right? <laughs> you know, all of you have probably been to those conferences. You can do anything you want, blah, blah, blah. Well, guess what? I had to have that bubble burst. You can't have people who are so optimistic and, and uh, that are assessing people incorrectly. If, you, if you're on a committee and, and you build roller coasters and they're like, okay, we're going to build this roller coaster. It's fine to have someone like, yes, come on, team, let's do it. Let's build this roller coaster in six months. We can do it. Well, guess what? The average roller coaster takes a whole a one year to two years to get it built. <laughs> you can't do it in six months. Uh, you know, so that's the thing is because they get so excited and optimistic, they may be unrealistic in those expectations. And then when it comes to people, oh, that person's so nice. Let's give them a job. But guess what? You didn't ask yourself 
is this person qualified? Do they have the skills? I used to believe anybody can do anything. No, I started to discover certain people are more talented to do something than others. And um, one of the things that as I would engage different people, um, I, whatever, I would go to a social setting, I would go with my wife and we would meet different people and they would have somebody who was so charming and so nice. And I'm like, oh my goodness, that person was so nice and also friendly. And I asked my wife, what do you think of her or, or this person? And she's like, nope, watch out with that person. And I'm like, what? What are, you, what are you talking about? They were so nice. It's just because my wife has a different lens in which she's looking at people, right? She, you know, I'm the more optimistic, like everyone's happy, everyone can get along. And she's much more cynical. And she's like, no, I'm going to observe you. I'm going to see how you interact, what you're doing, and, and, and can pick up nonverbal communications much better than I can, and things like that. So uh, I think it's very, very important under high stress, uh, you know, you can be as optimistic as you want of people or things, but it can't always help you. It's better to be more realistic. And then the other limitations, being inattentive to details. So this is so important because what ends up happening is if you've ever seen the Disney movie Up and, and you remember they put the uh, a collar on the dog and, and so that they can the dog can actually speak and the dog is talking and then suddenly he says squirrel and it gets easily distracted well that can happen for influencers i know me especially is because i love excitement entertainment and if i'm having a conversation or doing something like that guess what i can get distracted or i can get bored easily so again these are just other limitations uh that you can experience so here uh who here uh can share their digital hand and identify as yes i'm an influencer or you at least know somebody who totally fits the bill of being influencer i love to see that and while you're while you're raising that hands i'll see some of the comments uh, yes, um, uh, I'm thinking I'm a blend of dominant and influencer. Carter, totally understandable. Well, guess what? Remember those similarities between those two, that they're both active, that they really could shape those environments. So that's the similarity between them. Now, whenever you do a disc assessment or a test or something like that, you will answer a bunch of different questions. And guess what? When you get the results, and depending if you want to spend money to do a very in-depth disc assessment, they I've seen some of them where they'll say dominant, influencer, steadiness, and, and conscientiousness, and they rate you on a scale of zero to 100. And so you could have 50% dominant, 50% influencer, like 20% steadiness, or like you know 60% conscientiousness. So again, all various degrees, but at least you now have the language to describe all that is. Okay, Susan, I'm seeing my ex-husband is an influencer. Totally understand that. All right, let's keep going for the sake of the training. Uh, steadiness, uh, these are your people who you know are thoughtful when they shape in, uh, when they come into a new environment and are focused on people that like, I think of these people as just steadiness as uh, loving, uh, caring people. Uh, I like to think of them also sometimes as like the worker bees of the society, right? Uh, so if you've ever seen the Big Bang Theory, Raj, right? There's a, a funny episode where Raj comes and stays with Bernadette and Howard at their house and they're arguing over something. And Raj says, Howard, you need to listen to Bernadette. And, 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 so, <laughs> and so Howard gets so upset. He's like, man, you're making me look bad in front of my wife. You know, and it was kind of funny because guess what? That's the characteristics of steadiness. They are very careful, thoughtful people. They're, your, they're very friendly. They're great listeners, ultimate team players. They really want to understand you and un listen to your perspective. For them, their motto is stop and listen, that we need to listen more. So again, I used Oprah, I used Phoebe. Again, I think Phoebe might be a little bit more of an influencer, but I, again, I was just trying to take some images to help describe that steadiness uh, aspect. So let, let's talk about how they contribute to the team. So here we go. Value to the team, they're so dependable, okay? You want to have people who are S's. Uh, it's so interesting. I remember working in my different jobs and, and 
when the, uh, a company hired so many dominants that they just kept wanting to rise and, and get promoted. And they're like, if we promote everybody, then we're not going to have any workers left. You know, we can't have this many directors. So steadiness wants to just do their job and do it very well. Uh, they like to work for a leader for a cause, a very service oriented their ideal environment is stable, predictable. They love long-term work relationships and they don't like conflict. Um, and then under stress, they tend to be non-demonstrative. So whenever there's a stressful situation, I like to think of them as like a turtle. They're like, oh, there, something's going on. Boop. They go into their shell and they hide. The next thing is under high stress, they, they tend to be hesitant, right? They don't want to take that risk. So um, so if you have imagine, like, have you ever heard of that or seen that game Double Dutch where two people are doing the ropes like this and you have to like jump in and, and, and start jumping? Your S's may never jump in because they're keep waiting for that perfect moment to, until it's perfect before they actually do it. So again, a little bit hesitancy, especially under high stress. Inflexible. So how would that show up in a meeting where you have an S who may be having a meeting, they have an agenda, and somebody comes in and says, hey, you know, we've been doing this parade of the same way for all these years. Why don't we change it up? Let's do this. Let's do that. Who do you think that is? <laughs> your dominant or your influencer. And guess what? If they're under high stress, like there's only one month left and we need to do it. They're like, no, 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 no. We can't do any changes because they like that stability of that. Hence the word steadiness. They may, they may be a little bit inflexible. Another thing is the limitations. Whenever there's controversy, they might yield, right? Right. Because remember, they don't like the conflict. They may not want change like we talked about before. And then dealing with difficult and diverse situations. So here's an example. When I was, um, you know, managing different people, if as soon as a problem arose, a dominant, I wouldn't even know the problem came up because they, they might have already tried to figure out a solution on their own. But if you are dealing with a steadiness, they're going to say, uh oh, I've never encountered this situation before. What do I do? I need to talk to my manager, right? Because they haven't dealt with that. It's uncomfortable for them. So one of these techniques that I have used that has really helped me be a better manager, and so this is part of your all's professional development, this is what I do to really manage people. Whenever they were going, let's just say, a meeting with a potential client or a customer and there was some difficult issue, they would be nervous. They wouldn't know how that meeting would go. So what I would do is I'd say, okay, what is the agenda? What is our ultimate goal that we would like to have for this meeting? And X, Y, or Z. And I would say, okay, that's the goal. Have an agenda. This is what you say. Now, guess what? When you say all this, they can have three different reactions. They could either say, yes, wonderful. Uh, I love it and accept your proposal. They could say, you know what? I'm still uneasy. I'm uncertain. I have questions. And then guess what? That's okay. You can schedule another meeting. And, or they could say, no, I don't like this, uh, whatever it is. And you could say, okay, fine, we'll end it. But what you see what I did is I actually share with them all the potential scenarios so that they felt more comfortable going into that strange environment. And the analogy I use is uh, imagine a, a person going into a dark forest and all you have is a flashlight. For some people, that would be really scary, especially for your steadiness. They've never walked that path before, but your dominance like, come on, let's go. Let's go for the adventure, right? But your steadiness, what would help is if you could say, okay, uh, here's the flashlight. Now you're going to go down this path. You know, the path is going to split up, stay to the left. You're going to see these creatures. Okay, if you see a brown creature, don't worry. That's just a fox. They're, they're more scared of you. So guess what I'm doing? I'm, I'm helping them see all the potential scenarios so that when they go down the forest, they're like, oh, yeah, Tim mentioned that that could happen. So they're more comfortable and adapt. It's what makes the military and the Navy SEALs so good at what they do is good manager, good training is they're prepared for every given scenario. So again, word of advice, whatever profession you do, if you, the more trained and preparation you, you're doing, the better you're going to succeed. So let's keep going for the sake of time because there's a lot more content I want to give you. Um, last one is conscientiousness. So for these people, they're the ones that are 
um, uh, thoughtful when they enter an environment. So they kind of adapt to that environment. But what they focus on is less on people, but they're focusing on the task. So for them, they're big thinkers, analytical. Why? So for, for these individuals, it's all about being accurate analytical. Let's solve the problem. They have a high standard and they want to be precise. Their motto is we need to stop and let's check again. <laughs> so if you've ever met somebody who's highly conscientious, I'm going to give you an example. If you ask your friend, hey, what'd you think of that movie? And they're like, uh, and one friend's like, uh, you're like, I thought it was good. And their response is, no, the movie was not great. It was above average. The plot was weak, but the music was good and the actors were really good. <laughs> You're like, well, I just wanted to ask you whether you like the movie or not. But notice how precise they were, how detailed they were. I have, uh, I have friends and family that are exactly like this. I, I say something that I no, that's the incorrect definition of what you're saying. You, you mean this. And I'm like, oh, okay, yes. That's exactly what I mean. Do you see how precise they are? And then in terms of high standards, they want it to be the best. They want it to be perfect, right? So uh, when they're checking that email, they type up an email and guess what? They read it to find any grammar mistakes. And then they, hit, they still don't hit send. They have to read it again before they actually send it. So again, in media, uh, I used um, <laughs> Dwight from the office, Sheldon Cooper, and uh, you know President Obama. Now, again, I would actually say President Obama has a little bit of influencer in him because he could be very charismatic and funny and entertaining, but he's also established as this thinker, this process-oriented individual. So something to consider. Uh, <laughs> I, I love Susan, your comment. That's why I use Grammarly. I'm terrible at grammar too, but you know, it's just speaking of that, I have a friend uh, who I work out with uh, on Zoom and, uh, or on our uh, FaceTime uh, phones and uh, four times a week. And you'd be surprised. He is so conscientious and so accurate that I really have to be very careful with what I say. He's always correcting my text, you know, or uh, in terms of grammar. Uh, he's a writer, of course, but, uh, you know, it's just so interesting. But some people would be annoyed by that. But guess what? I actually enjoy it because I want to improve my grammar. I want to improve the way that I speak. I do want to be more accurate in my speech. So, uh, you know, so something that I'm, I'm really learning. So here, here's how they bring value to the team. Conscientious and steady. They like to define, clarify, and get information. They like to be your anchor of reality. So remember that meeting that we were talking about? Let's build a roller coaster in six months. Your high C would say, no, this is not possible. It takes on average two years to build a roller coaster, and we should do it in 2.5 with a 0.5 year, six month contingency plan in case something goes wrong. Like very realistic. No, you, you're glad that you have them part of your team, right? Otherwise, we're all making promises that we're never keeping. The ideal environment is where critical thinking is needed. They like technical work, specialized area, a familiar work environment. So remember how I said I had that employee that loved to connect with people? Well, guess what? Highly conscientious people, they may not need all of that. You could actually put them in a room. They could be people who are scientists, uh, you know, people who are programmers, you know, engineers that can just be very focused, very accurate, very detailed. You know, you slide a pizza box underneath the door and they're happy. You know why? Because for them, they're using their brain and they're solving problems and they get to be accurate and they have to be precise and all those other kind of things. So when they're stressed out, they can be pessimistic. They can be overly picky. They can be critical. Let me actually share with you a brief story of how this happened with me. So I developed the skill of being highly conscientious. And so whenever I was under high stress, I was doing a leadership conference and I had team members I had to present. And then my team members had to present and the president of the company was there and the founder. So I was stressed out because I wanted them to do a great presentation. And because of that, I had a team member who did a presentation and then they came back to me and they say, Tim, what do you think? 
And I would say, this was good, but you messed up on this. You did this wrong, but, 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 but. And you could just see how they deflated they got because I was being so nitpicky because I wanted everything to be perfect. Do you see how that demoralized that team member? Again, this is something that I've learned, you know, throughout the years from my experience. And now as a manager, I would say, don't mention it if it's not critical. So I would say, this is the thing that you did really well. Here's something you did that was that I would criticize. That's something that you can prove, but overall, great job, you know, move on. That's it. You know, that's all that's really needed. So uh, if you're very, if you're very much like that, you know, you know, learn from my mistakes. Uh, possible limitations is get defensive with criticize when criticized. Oh my goodness. As a manager trying to manage employees who are high C's, do you know how difficult it was? And especially me getting criticism from my manager. Why is it so difficult? Because they're perfectionists. And if you're a perfectionist, you don't think that you did anything wrong. So I would say, so I would have a manager said, Tim, your presentation was, uh, <laughs> excuse me, too, uh, too short. You're like, well, they only gave me 10 minutes. I had so much more information that I wanted to put, but I couldn't include because I had to thought, uh, do it within that format or whatever, you know, whatever it may be. Tim, you didn't have enough slides in there. It's like, well, I had so much content. You know, there's always a reason on why you did what you did and you're not really listening to that feedback. Does anybody resonate with this? Uh, uh, are any of you identifies as high C's and know people like this? <laughs> I'm seeing Elizabeth. This is 100% you. Uh, Susan, what what are you? Are you a high C or know someone like this? No, I'm a high C. I'm a very high C. Well, it's very important because it, it helps you. Give me one second. I have to cough. It is very important because highly successful, productive people are high Cs, you know, and and that's okay. It's just I'm a matter perfectionist. I, I, I want everything perfect. This is the way it is. And that's <laughs> the way it's going to be. And very, 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 very uh, uh, apprehensive about change and everything else. So no, no. So I, that is very good. But <clears throat> remember, let's talk about the limitations of it, though, right? So imagine you're a highly perfectionist. You're sending an email. You want to make it perfect, right? Well, guess what? You reviewed it, reviewed it, reviewed it. All this time, the D has already sent off three emails and you're still working on the one email. Now, that's not to say that you shouldn't spend time on that email, especially if it's to a customer or a client. But if you're sending it to your coworker, why does the email have to be per perfect? So again, knowing the situation, knowing when to happen is going to be very important. Aisha, I see your hand raised. Uh, please share. Yeah, so I just want to kind of touch base on that. So when I first took this leadership, this leadership position that I'm in right now, uh -huh. um, I was highly critical of myself and I would just sit there for hours writing emails because these were people that I've never interacted with before. I was mm -hmm. completely new to the environment and I was remote. So I had to kind of, you know, learn everything by myself, and I'm over here sitting, analyzing this, these emails like 80 million times. In the meantime, like a week goes by, and I haven't sent out the information. And then when someone else asks me, "Oh, have you done it?" I'm just there, like, "No, I haven't." So, but <laughs> thank God, like over time, like now it's been over like six months that I've been working in this position, and I've learned so much. I've learned to you know quickly send out these emails. I have drafts already prepped for a lot of like the types of emails that I have to send. So now it's like very quick, but definitely that was me at one point. Well, that's perfect. And I'm so glad that you discovered that. And yeah, that could be a lot of people, uh, you know, when we, when we are trying to be perfect, it, it can be overwhelming. Right. And then we causes us to not get as much done. And, and I'm glad that you discovered that and then worked on that and improved that just know the different situations. If it's an inter-office email, to a coworker, it doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, a customer or client, you know, what I would like to do, depending on the urgency, if it's not urgent, you're right. Uh, draft it up, do something else, come back to it later and read it, or read it the next day if you have a lot more time. But being in a different mode, different environment, things like that. And I just love that tip of having all these different uh, drafts ready to go. Do you know that as a manager, 
I would write evaluations and then I, you know, my manager would edit them all the time because she was a D, a little bit of a high C and a perfectionist. And she would want to say it the exact same thing in her own words when it said the same exact thing. So I'm like, oh my goodness, I roll. But guess what? She's my manager. I have to respect her because this is the what the format that she wanted. So I learned. Guess what? Use this language. So I copied and pasted and used her language. And guess what? Every time she would edit and look at my evaluations for my team members, less edits, right? Because I used her exact same language. So I, I believe that's very smart, Aisha, to use templates and everything like that. Oh my goodness, we're talking about so much. There's so much more I want to share with you. So let's let's keep going. Uh, who do you dislike? I bet you there are a lot of people that you dislike. <laughs> I know I did. <laughs> so why do you dislike certain people? There could be a whole host of reasons, but I would like to bring it back to personality type. So I have seen that you tend to dislike people who are of the opposite personality type as you will. So in this example of using these four discs, dominants don't usually like people who with high degrees of steadiness. Why is that? Well, think about dominance, right? Very direct, to the point, etc. What about steadiness? Hesitating under high stress, right? Uh, not expressive. Uh, you know, uh, it tends to be more agreeable. Uh, doesn't want to uh, have conflict. But the dominance, like, give me your opinion. What's going on? Why didn't you say something? <laughs> you know, all those other kind of things. So you could see where conflicts could happen. Influencers don't usually like conscientious people. Why? Influencers like, hey, everybody, let's get along. Let's be optimistic. We can do it. And the conscience is like, no, that can't be done. You know, that's going to take too long. You know, uh, an influencer says, Tim, uh, or, you know, Johnny, I have this great idea. We can do this. Bah, 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 bah. Guess what? The conscientious person's like, give me the details. Uh, what evidence have you shown that this has been uh, will be a successful event? And so you, they're wanting excitement, and enthusiasm to match, and they're all up here in their head. It's like problem. How are we going to solve that solution and things like that? So you can see the conflict, right? Steadiness doesn't usually do like dominance because they think that they're they may be uncaring, too mean, too harsh, too aggressive, all those other kind of things. And conscientious again, don't like influencers. They talk so much. I asked a yes or no question. Why are you telling me a whole story? Just answer the question. Be very specific. Influencers are super dramatic. Like, we can do this. They're like, no, be specific. That's unrealistic. So you're starting to see how the conflicts can occur. So uh, this is something to know when uh, there is conflict. Okay, <laughs> Susan, you're starting to see that. <laughs> That's how you were with your ex. That's hilarious. So a dominant, when a conflict happens, what do they want? They want to win and they, they can, they make demands, right? That's what happens when they want a conflict for influencers. They just need to express themselves. What they really want is just acknowledgement. Can you please just acknowledge that I have a viewpoint and that you, you you're listening to me and understand me because that's, what's really important to them. Steadiness when they have conflict, like, can we all just get along? It's about, let's just comply. Let's just have some harmony. Let's just let's just not not deal with it. For conscientious people, remember they're all about accuracy and preciseness. So if something has happened, there's a conflict. Like, no, we need justice. This this are uh, the consequences for this, and that's what it needs to be done. There is a wrong way, and there's a right way, and that's what needs to be done. So that is what they care about most when it comes to those different things. So again, I hope this is very helpful for you when you're understanding different conflicts with different personality types. So now here's my cheat sheet, okay? So whenever you're dealing with a dominant, what do you do? You get to the point. Don't use small talk, be brief, be very loud and clear and be confident. Uh, dominants respect people who are very confident. It was interesting. I encountered a dominant once and I'm usually very agreeable. So I usually like whatever you want, blah, blah. but I stood up. And I said, no, I'm not going to do that. And guess what? They're like, good job. I, that was a test, Tim. You passed. I respect you now because you have a spine. And I'm like, what? Does that mean you didn't respect me before? No, they didn't. Because 
in their world, there was a bunch of pushovers. They want people to have an opinion, to be have a different perspective, to challenge and stuff like that. Very, very interesting. I didn't know that. I thought we should all get along, but no, apparently having a spine makes a big difference. Um, influencers, be very friendly, socialize, be funny, be attentive, be very sincere. Uh, influencers love humor. Um, I, I would always have people come up to me and, and uh, before they have the a meeting agenda, they would be friendly. And they're like, so Tim, how's your going? How's your day? Bah, bah, bah. But understand just because somebody's an influencer doesn't always mean that you need to have a chit chat about their whole life and their pets and all those other kind of things. Uh, because I would actually resent that because Hey, I'm a busy person too. It's just a matter of, can you just be nice and be friendly? Hey, Tim, how's it going? I, I'm just going very well. How can I help you? Okay, sure. Thanks. I have a quick question. Blah, 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 blah. And like, just get direct to the point. I don't mind that as long as they were very nice about it. Steadiness, be very gentle. Don't be harsh and critical. It will drive them or shut them uh, down. Um, the, the, uh, the other important thing is, Get them to uh, have yourself share first before they share. Let me give you an example. So if I was talking to a steadiness person, I wouldn't say, so what do you think of that movie? They'd be like, uh, uh, I don't know. It's, it's too much to uh, maybe asking of them and they don't know and they haven't th formulated their thoughts and opinions. So sometimes I would say, you know what? That movie, I really liked it. I liked the plot. I liked the actors. The music was good. What did you think of the movie? But because you shared first, they feel more comfortable sharing. Oh yeah, I did like the, the music and stuff like that. Another thing is don't rush them, right? Uh, give them time. Sometimes I'll have a very important decision or have a meeting. And I know that I'm dealing with a steadiness person. And I would say, you know what? Why don't you think about it and let's connect tomorrow. Like they would appreciate that. You don't always have all the time to do that you know, uh, depending on the urgency, but it, you know, sometimes people need more time to process. The D is going to give their opinion right away. And then there's a phrase that I was always told in leadership in my college that they say, praise publicly and criticize privately. What does that mean? That means is everybody loves to get praise of how awesome they are. And I guess what? That's false. Because I was misled. I thought everybody loved public praise. No, steadiness people don't like uh, a public praise. That's embarrassing. If I say, you know, Tanisha, you did such a great job in this event. They're like, oh my goodness. Yeah, like I'm all the center of attention. I didn't ask for this. I didn't want this. But if I would have known that they're a high S, I would have gone to them privately and say, hey, Tanisha, I just wanted to say the event that you just did was so amazing. I love the people and uh, it was so well attended. Da -da. Just thank you for everything you're doing. That means so much more to them than just making some big public declaration. Now, if they're an influencer, <laughs> then maybe they might like that attention. Okay. And then the conscientious people, give them facts, figures. Uh, they like details. Uh, stop asking them uh, to get personal. Like, let's get to know each other. I want to know all about you. That's what I used to do as an influencer. I wanted to really connect with people. They're like, no, don't ask me these questions. What do you want? Let's solve the problem, etc. And the other thing is you can acknowledge them for their intellect because they like to, you know, solve problems, be very creative. So if you can recognize them for their, their work on those things, uh, they appreciate that. So that's just some conscientious. Now, here's my favorite part of the presentation. Okay, you ready for it? What are the greatest predictors of success? <laughs> so you can imagine in every different field, you may say, well, guess what? For different, for different industries, maybe a influencer would be more successful than another person. Or maybe you need somebody uh, who's highly conscientious, like an engineer, if you're like building a plane, et cetera. So you may say, okay, better people are better suited. But here's my challenge to all of you. I'm going to give you an example of where I think that's all wrong. Based on the research, what we have found, uh, and not all done by me, but also uh, resonates with my personal experience, the greatest predictor of success is da, 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 conscientiousness. And I'm going to give you a perfect example. <laughs> I love eating at the Cheesecake Factory. Okay, don't judge me. I love their bread. So imagine you are eating at the Cheesecake Factory or whatever restaurant that you're in, 
and you have a, 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 a waitress and she's so nice and so pleasant. And you're like, so friendly, like, oh, that's so kind, you know, and you make your order. You're like, I like a black bean burger with no pickles, uh, no onions, da, 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 right? And shout, no, no, sure, no problem, sweetie. We'll get it for you, blah, 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 exactly the way you want it. You're like, oh my goodness, high influencer, really great. Uh, she loves people, she's connecting. I, I'm gonna give her a big tip. Well, guess what? What happens if she's not highly conscientious and she doesn't uh, listen very carefully? She didn't write it all down. She was to so focused on our conversation that she forgot to repeat the, the order before she left the table. And so she goes, gets the dishes, and you got mustard, you got pickles, it's the wrong burger, and says, I'm so sorry, I'll, I'll go replace that for you. So to me, that's a perfect example of, I don't care what industry you're in, having a high level of conscientiousness is a bigger predictor of success. And the reason why I know it is because I did not have a high level of conscientiousness. I wanted to succeed. I didn't want to disappoint people. Remember, I was the high influencer. So I worked so hard to be successful that I ended up becoming highly conscientious. And it really helped me. Here is a, um, uh, a presentation that, that I do called Secrets to Getting Your Dream Job or Internship. And I have all the list of the different personality traits, uh, skills, and, and personalities. And I said, you know what? Why don't we just put the disc uh, uh, style that is most associated with that skill or that quality that will help them in that role? And are you starting to see a pattern? Uh, a high C is very successful at doing all these different things. So very, very insightful. Then uh, I read these two books. Now, here's what I want to share with you. Now that you've learned all about personality assessments, DISC and everything, you are going to have new lenses in which you see the world. And it's going to be very easy for you to start judging people. You're like, ha ha, that person's a dominant. That person's an influencer. That person's a, a steadiness. That person's a conscientious. You're just going to, you can't help but do it now that you have these new pair of eyes in which to see everything. But you're going to make a mistake as I have, if you just view everybody in those lenses, because you don't want to like, okay, Tim, I'm only going to hire highly conscientious people. Well, not the whole world is not con highly conscientious. You're going to need different people with different skills and talents. But I love this book by Patrick Lencioni. He's a, a business writer and he's written a lot more books than these. But he says that if you were to work on a team, regardless of their personality, there are three qualities that you want to have happen. You want to have someone who's humble, someone who's hungry, and somebody who's people smart. Now, what we mean by hungry is somebody who's tenacious, that has some drive in them. People who are people smart, have some emotional intelligence. So if you have those characteristics, I think that you're going to be successful. So in that, I do see a little bit of all the different personalities. Humble, I, maybe I see a little bit of an S in there. I see tenacity. I see that D, that person that wants to succeed and, and achieve the goal. People smart, I see the influencer, the very diplomatic individual. So those are all characteristics. And if they can have that, they can succeed in the role. Um, and then the last thing is once you have a team, you well, some teams fail. And that's why he wrote this book called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. And he says, these are the problems. So I would like to outline in parentheses what the problems are, but I like to put it in the positive spin on what you could do about that. So the biggest problem is number one is in teams, people are not vulnerable. So can you already see the S's when there's some kind of conflict and they're like, they're not speaking up? Maybe they do need to speak up and they need to be more assertive and give their thoughts, even though that could risk upsetting people or people not liking it. The next thing is constructive conflict. You need constructive conflict. You can't just avoid controversy. What would happen if the Titanic was, was sailing and somebody saw a problem and like, we're going to hit an icebreaker and they're like, oh, but I don't, the captain looks kind of busy and he looks really upset and I don't want to upset him any further. So I'm not going to say anything. No, you need healthy conflict as long as it's constructive. And then you got to get commitment and buy-in. Some people are like, oh, I don't care whether we do this or not. Like the team's going to fail. 
And then you have to hold people accountable. You got to get that commitment and make sure that they do what they said they were going to do. And then lastly, they need to focus on your results. If you're not getting the results done and they're like, oh, whatever, it's not going to succeed. So just these are some helpful tips whenever you get to a position where you have to hire people, manage people and anything like that. And I always ask these questions like, are you humble? Are you hungry? Are, do you have good emotional intelligence with people? I'm going to hire you for whatever position that they're applying for, because I'm already assuming that I'm interviewing them because they have those skills. So that's the end of the presentation. It's 701, perfect timing. Uh, so uh, just to recap, extrovert versus introvert, you know, there's agreeableness, conscientiousness, openness, and neuroticism. Uh, when it comes to DISC, there are four personality types, dominant, influencer, uh, steadiness and conscientious and dominant. Their motto is hurry up. Let's go. Influencers hurry up. So let's talk. Uh, steadiness is stop. And we need to listen more and conscientious is stop. And let's check again. And remember the biggest predictor of success is conscientiousness. So if you can develop that, you're going to be more successful. And they, there's other books that have been written on some of the most successful CEOs. And you would be surprised. You'd think that they'd be very extroverted, outgoing leaders. No, they're very conscientious individuals, very thoughtful, have their priorities every day. They're working on those priorities. How do we get them done? Figuring out, taking actions, getting their people to do that. That is what is a very successful skill to have. Uh, hire a team that's humble, hungry, and people smart and manage a team that's your, you you know, build trust by not being, so you have to be vulnerable, create constructive conflict, get commitment and buy-in, hold people accountable and focus on getting the results. So I hope you guys enjoyed the session. Uh, just some final announcements. Next session, next Thursday, we'll have the tea with Tim. And so what we're going to be doing is I'm going to watching, sharing some videos uh, about purpose, passion, and beliefs. And then we're going to just have discussions on them. So, uh, and then you'll be filling out a post assessment. Uh, next thing, I'm also going to be setting up a Telegram chat. This is the way, one of the ways in which we can start networking with each other. Um, I'm a big fan, or let's, let's put it the other way. I'm very critical of social media. Uh, I have social media, but I don't check it often. It's the way I'm able to be most productive. I hate getting notifications and having people, my phone buzzing all the time with all that other chats. So if you do get Telegram, my request is that you silence notifications. And here's the reason why. Uh, it's People are gonna chat, people are gonna connect, but what ends up happening is if you're going to get your phone buzzing all the time and there's a chat going on and it's distracting, I'd rather you have that silenced and not see it. And then you every two days or whatsoever, check on in on it and see what's going on. Then be constantly notified and get so frustrated. You're like, Oh, I'm sick of all these chats. I'm going to leave the group. I want you to stay in the group because I want you to connect. And then a couple of rules. Don't have lengthy one-on-one -on -one conversations with people switch to private chat. Uh, I love for people to share, be vulnerable, right? You know, what are they learning? Uh, any videos they want to share, something like that related to the topic. Don't spam people and putting all these different things. Uh, professional appropriate content. Um, oh, we don't subscribe to any political parties, so don't use it as a platform to recruit or whatever. Democrats, Republicans, none of that. Um, uh, and then treat each other with respect. And it's okay if someone leaves the group. Now, uh, the other thing about it is, um, when I, I talk about treating people with respect, you know, I remember, you know, you're going to meet a lot of different people connecting with them from different schools, New York, New Jersey, wherever. Uh, this is not an opportunity for you to hook up, right, or find partners or things like that. You know, I, I've, I'm successful that we have a good group of people. I only had one incident where there was one student that was very attracted to this other student and, 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 and kept, you know, following up and, and guess what? She was just ignoring him. And then it got to the point where she felt uncomfortable. And so again, never put yourself in that situation, be very direct with people, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, respect people's space. And uh, I have some videos that I'll be sharing with the group on the telegram so that just to cover yourself, if you're any victim of harassment, tell them to stop. And you also all have Title IX representatives on your campus that you can report certain individuals uh, to stop that. And uh, again, anybody who's doing that is not welcome in the group. It's not living the values of elective society. So let's prevent any from like that from happening. So thank you all so much.
at this point, I'll take any questions that you might have. Uh, and if you don't have any questions, uh, please fill out the, the Q&A assessment. I'm going to uh, actually right now put it in the chat. So give me one second so you can actually fill out the post assessment for today. And in this post assessment, what you'll do is you'll answer the questions about the training today. If you liked it, you know, how would you rate it? Uh, hold on, I need to send this to everybody, everybody in the meeting. Here we go, boom. All right, everybody has that in the chat. So please click on that link. I'll also send it with the recording so that you could watch it. But does anybody have any questions so far about this training that I can help answer for you? All right, no questions? I'll, I'll take at least one or two comments. Uh, maybe some people that we haven't heard from. Uh, Ryan, what do you think of the presentation? Feel free to unmute yourself. Hi, yes, I really enjoyed the presentation and um, I'm a psychology major, so it's nice to um, you know, like be reminded of some terms that I haven't heard you know, in a long time, so it was really helpful. Oh, okay, I'm so glad. Thanks so much for joining. And, and uh, Justin, what about you? What do you think of the training? Justin, you can unmute yourself if you want. I think maybe Justin's having uh, audio technical difficulties. Don't worry about it, Justin. I could see that it's still trying to connect. And then uh, how about what we get one final comment? Puru Sotam, how do I pronounce your name? Feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, you can call me by my last name, which is Shah. Hey, Shah. Okay, thanks. I appreciate that. So, Shah, what do you think of the training? No, it, it was uh, insightful. A uh, lot of new things I got a chance to learn. So, really looking forward to this. And thank you so much. No, no problem. Thanks so much for, for joining. So, everybody, please click on that link right there. Uh, that It's the bit.ly link so that you can complete the post assessment. And, um, and then uh, we'll be able to say, it. oh yes, I did see Justin that your connection was unstable, no problem. You'll be able to connect to that. So I'll see everybody next Thursday and uh, I look forward to sp speaking and seeing you all then. All right, have a great night, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye everyone.